Our next uh, honored guest is, is Michael Twighty. Dr. Twighty has a BA in math from St. Olaf College and an MS and PhD degree in statistics from Iowa State University. Dr. Twighty has worked very closely with Dr. Deming on a number of his four-day sessions. Dr. Twighty believes the management philosophy of Dr. W. Edwards Deming is equally well suited to the service industry as well as to manufacturing. Dr. Twyda will be talking about one of his favorite topics today, that is learning beyond the knowledge of processes which create results, both of which management must know in order to lead the improvement of the business. Today he will talk about the contributions made learning about the system of profound knowledge. Ladies and gentlemen, please warmly welcome with me Dr. Michael Twyda talking about the role of learning and improving organizations. Thank you all. It's, it was interesting this morning, Bill Schirkenbach commented that uh, after Dr. Deming spoke, Bill was going to take a step down in one more step of detail and, and deal with some of the issues of profound knowledge. Henry's done the same thing. Tom Nolan, tomorrow afternoon, as you all hear him, he'll talk to you about some insights from profound knowledge and its connection to learning. Well, instead of taking a step down in detail from what Dr. Deming talked about this morning, my intent, at least today, I'm not sure it started out that way, but my intent in this talk is to take maybe a step up from profound knowledge and talk about maybe where profound knowledge fits into the overall structure or all overall process of improvement in your organization. Now some of that comes from, as John was saying, I've had the opportunity to, to attend a number of Dr. Deming's four-day seminars, and profound knowledge is a is a very commonly misunderstood concept, I think. Um, there's a, there are a lot of the attendees who don't really understand what profound knowledge is, where it applies, how it relates to improvement in their organizations. And so as it turns out, that's what I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, really talking sort of empirically as much as, as uh, theoretically, some of this talk is based on things I've observed as well as things that I, that I have uh, reasonable theory about. So an overview of the presentation, the overview is very simple. I'm going to do an introduction, then I'm going to talk about approaches taken to improvement, and really I'm going to highlight three different approaches. I'm going to talk about people who view improvement as change of processes. One other comment before we get too far into this. There's a paper in your, in your book, but not all the illustrations and things that are on my overheads are in the paper. Uh, OQPF is currently copying that, and it'll be available tomorrow morning. I'm, you've been promised now, okay? So, the core of this talk is really that I have observed in my few years of working on this quality improvement stuff that sort of three different ways that people go about improving their organizations and improving quality. The first one that I'm going to talk about is improvement viewed as change of work processes, and I'll get into that more in, in more depth in just a minute. Second one is talking about improvement viewed as learning about processes. Also usually work processes, the sort of core work processes of organizations. And then finally, learning which leads to improving organizations. I probably should have said profound knowledge, but I haven't yet convinced myself that profound knowledge, the system of profound knowledge as Dr. Deming is, has defined it is all the learning that can add to improvement. I think that's core learning, but I think there are probably some other things that we can learn that will benefit us in our organizations. So I will, but I will mostly talk about profound knowledge there. And I'll really get to profound knowledge, and I'll, and I'll try to say a little bit about a couple insights that I've gained recently. I mean, you'll see a couple hand-drawn, handwritten charts, because those insights came in the airplane last night as I was, as I was uh, studying some stuff about uh, philosophy and psychology. I, I got some insights I felt I had to share with you today. So you'll excuse me when you get to the, near the end and you see a few hand-drawn charts. But anyway, if, and then the conclusion is just that, okay? So I'm going to start with an overview of, of my perspective. So my bias will be imme immediately apparent to you. In this diagram, what I do is I talk about, I'm having a little problem with being straight today, um, is talk about three different types, three different approaches to improvement, these three approaches. And I've graphed what I see as potential results of those improvements. One of them is focused on the idea of process change. 
One is focused on the idea of process learning and what happens when we do that. And the last one is focused on profound knowledge and this other sort of not, not um, clearly related knowledge, the knowledge that's not clearly related to our business processes to a lot of people. So, and again, you'll get, you'll get copies of all these overheads if you want them tomorrow. Okay? I guess what I would ask is, before we get started, we, we've, we've been hearing a lot about profound knowledge. And, and I guess this is a rhetorical question. A question I would ask is, how many of you in your organizations put a lot of stock and encouragement in teaching people things like profound knowledge? Henry does. The British Deming Association does. And there's somebody in the back that does. And there aren't very many other hands that I see. I see in one, a couple more hands held kind of low. I mean, some of those components people in our organizations can live with. But when we get to, like, theory of knowledge, how many of you in your organizations have regularly offered courses on the theory of knowledge inside your organizations? Not very many, huh? How many of you teach people about psychology in your organizations? In lots of ways, there are lots of companies that do some teaching about aspects of psychology. They might talk about temperament or psychological type or things like that, and those are related, of course. Um, but there's some other stuff about psychology, too. In fact, I know of an organization. It's a very large organization. Um, there's some representatives here, and I hope I don't get my friends in trouble. But I know of an organization where there's a small group of people that, hearing Dr. Deming, decided they wanted to study the, the theory of knowledge. And they wanted to study C.I. Lewis. And they finally decided that they would engage a, a professor of philosophy. And they've been studying philosophy for over a year in their organization. Now, it's all above board. I mean, you know, their purchase orders are all signed, and, and everything's done fine. But they're still kind of concerned that if some of the people up the chain a few steps really find out what it is they're studying, that'll be the end of it. So they're being kind of quiet about what, the, what it is they're doing. Because they, they don't have the sense that their organization values the work they're doing. So if, if I can get to a point where you will go away and say, you know, there's a lot of value to doing some of this work, to learning about psychology, to learning about the theory of knowledge, um, I think I will have achieved my, my result for today. Now, that's really strange, given that my degree's in statistics, right? I didn't see anything about variation. Well, anybody who's heard me before has probably heard more about variation than they'd like to hear, so I'll try to avoid that one for a little while today. And I think that's one of the things that already is being recognized more widely in organizations. So, onward. The first piece is just talking about, let's talk about what it means to, what kind of improvements we can get focusing on changing processes. What kind of improvements can we get changing processes? And my idea here is that we can get improvements that follow that kind of a curve. Now, maybe that's not really representative of what happens in organizations. But let me tell you a little bit about what my sense is. My sense is you get some quick results as you put in place actions in line with what maybe is already known about a process. I have, there are a variety of manifestations that I've seen of this same phenomenon, and I want to share those with you. Now, maybe some of you in your organizations or someplace else have run into some of these things. One of them is, and this one is, no, I don't hear so much anymore. I don't know if any of you have ever heard that. The first one, we do SPC. I don't know if they do lunch, but they do SPC. Okay. Now, I'm not trying to belittle SPC, and I'll come back to that in just a second. How about... QC circles as the quality program, that's the whole thing. That's the whole, you know, that's all there is. You know, we're talking, again, employee involvement. Get them together and everything will get better. This is, the next one, sort of a pet peeve of mine, and maybe, that, and maybe it shouldn't appear in this list except that it is a pet peeve of mine. Designed experimentation, I don't know how many of you are familiar with that, but designed experimentation where we play pick the winner. It's a game, kind of, you know? It's not like we really learn something about the process. It's like we run a designed experiment, and then we pick whichever result turned out the nicest, and that's where we run our, our process from there on. Now, if you don't know of anybody who does that, good. And this one is one of the ones that absolutely drives me crazy. Don't bother us with the way, with why these tools work. Don't, don't, 
bore us with the theory about these tools. We just know there are these quality tools out there. And if you give them to us and show us how to apply them, we can solve all our problems and everything will be great. But don't bother about why. I guess I'm one of those why kind of people. You know, I don't believe you can apply the tools appropriately unless you understand something about why. So some of these, I've been in some of these organizations that really are immune to learning things. They want to apply what already is there. So the note here at the bottom is, is sort of a caveat. I don't want to get myself in too much trouble here. I want to say using SPC, statistical process control, applying tools, chartering process improvement teams or QC circles, conducting design experiments are all appropriate as parts of the transformation. So please don't misunderstand me. I'm talking about organizations where those things are the quality transformation. And I think some organizations start that way and recognize that they need to do more. I have an example. There's a company I work with that makes a complicated product and, and then they calibrate this product for a variety of different applications. I won't tell you any more about that, but except to say that, that this company was having a real problem with calibration in this plant. Calibration was, the, was far and away the bottleneck process, the process that constrained their ability to meet schedules. Its capacity, or its, its output, was much lower than any of the other processes feeding it, or their ability, obviously, to ship stuff onto the customer. So the charter came down, improve calibration, improve red, get more stuff through calibration so we can send more stuff to our suppliers, to our, to our customers, so we don't have unhappy customers, we can meet our schedule obligations. And that was the charter. And the team looked at, the, at their job exactly that way. Now they thought of the, their job was really calibrating parts and packing and shipping parts, because that was the relevant issue here. We had to pack and ship parts in appropriate numbers, mostly. I mean, not that they would sacrifice quality. I mean, I don't, I don't mean to say that, but the focus was right here. Calibrate parts and then pack them and ship them. That looks like kind of an empty picture, doesn't it? If you think of improvement in terms solely of change, what do you get? Well, some of the things that I've observed are things like this. I've seen often that some quick progress is made. You move in the right direction quickly. However, focus is usually on the outcomes. Did you, did you make progress or didn't you? And progress is defined by did you, make, did you get more through the system today than yesterday or whatever, whatever is a characteristic of interest. So you ask, was the change a success or failure? And success or failure means were the results better after you made the change than before. So the focus is on let's change something, see if something got better. If it got better, great. Let's institutionalize that and let's change something else and see if it got better again. Making a mistake is B-A-D. Probably should be big B-A-D. I know lots of people who have uh, effectively put significant walls in, in their career path by making a mistake, even in improvement processes. It's bad news. Progress, I think, is limited by existing knowledge. You can't go beyond what you already know. So if you've seen an organization that says, we're going to improve quality, and we're going to spend time on it, we're going to spend money on it, and we're going to spend a lot of effort on it, things often get better by brute force. And what did they get? I don't know. Will the results last? I don't know. Are they real, or did somebody manufacture them? I don't know. Anyway, lots of organizations start out that way. One question I'd ask, and I guess in an audience of 650, well, with a drop off from the break, it looks like 615, um, where is this applied? Is this kind of an approach applied? As I'm using Dr. Deming's picture for a different reason. If we think of, a, of an organization as a system, where do we apply this approach? Almost always in these core work processes, the unique 
bottom level work processes in the organization. Now this happens in organizations where the response is, hey, this quality is great stuff for my folks. That's not funny, huh? Maybe you should be crying. None of you work in organizations like that. Good. All right, so the next stage, and that's all I really want to say about that, is I, I think that's a place where a lot of people start. I know a lot of people, however, who recognize the limitations of that kind of an approach, that they can only get what they already know. So they later on decide that they need to take a different approach. And they say, let's focus on process improvement. Let's focus on learning about processes and see what we get from that. See if we can get any improvement from that. Okay? And so this is the next stage. Now, I drew this curve this way for a reason. Often we start focusing on learning about processes. If this is demonstrable improvement in whatever, whatever quality characteristics you're interested in, if this is demonstrable improvement down here, the improvement doesn't come immediately because often you have to acquire new knowledge about this process before you can improve it. Okay. So that's why I drew this curve this way. And, what, and how do we do that? What's the tool? What's the methodology for doing that? The most powerful one I know, we've seen a couple times already today, is the Schuert cycle for learning or improvement, the PDSA cycle. Japanese call it the Deming wheel. Okay. So plan, do, study, act. And uh, maybe it's a strong presumption, but it is a presumption that you've all seen this before. And that's a way to get improvement. Now, however, I have seen people with the first approach, the change things approach, that say they're following the Deming cycle. They say, we're going to change something. Did it work? Yes or no? I mean, that's the whole, that's the whole uh, study in ACT. Is, did it work? Great. If it worked, then let's do another one. Okay. An, inter an interesting thing I've learned about this is that if you expect to pursue the PDSA cycle and get an answer to a question, you'll often be disappointed. I don't know if anybody's had that experience. But something I've found as I've tried to pursue the PDSA cycle is often what I get is, well, some answers, but fundamentally I get a lot more questions. I don't know, does anybody ever have that experience? I found it put really well in uh, a book published in well, 1972 or 1973. If you looked at the reference list at the back of my paper, you saw Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, even though it wasn't referred to in my paper. And you might have wondered, why would he refer to that book? Well, some people like that because it's got a great definition of quality. But my issue with it is the main character in Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance started out as a scientist. Okay? And he's, he's really, it sounds like a prodigy. He was taking college classes by the time he was like 15, I think. On page 101, it talks about his love of the scientific method and pursuit of science. And so I'll read you a passage, and please bear with me as I do this. This guy studied scientific truths. Then he became upset even more by the apparent cause of their temporal condition. See, he was looking for absolute truths, and he became upset because the more he studied, the more he found that scientific truth is almost a misnomer because they didn't last. It looked as though the time spans of scientific truths are an inverse function of the intensity of scientific effort. What shortens the lifespan of the existing truth is the volume of hypotheses offered to replace it. The more the hypotheses, the shorter the time span of the truth. And what seems to be causing the number of hypotheses to grow in recent decades seems to be nothing other than scientific method itself. The more you look, the more you see. I think that's one of the insights of the scientific method or the PDSA cycle. The more you look, the more you see. Instead of selecting one truth from a multitude, you are increasing the multitude. What this means logically is that you, are tr you try to move toward unchanging truth through the application of scientific method. You actually do not move toward it at all. You move away from it. It's your application of scientific method that is causing it to change. In other words, the more you learn, the more you understand that the end point is moving away from you. There is no final achievement. OK, so that's what I'd like to say about the PDSA cycle, assuming that the rest is familiar to you. 
except to share something that will look suspiciously different. In a recent book, I mean, it's suspiciously similar. In a recent book by a guy named Charles Handy called The Age of Unreason, Handy talks about a cycle for learning. He talks about the need to learn to adapt to increasing change in our world. And I'll just propose this to you, that his cycle says question, theory, test, reflection. Hmm. Maybe that sounds kind of familiar. I describe it as a wheel to emphasize that it is meant to go round and round. One set of questions duly answered and tested and reflected upon leads to another. Okay. So that's just, that's from Charles Handy. One other insight about, about learning and the scientific method or whatever. Uh, George Box, I don't know the original reference for this kind of stuff, but he's been talking about this kind of stuff for a long time. He's got a model where, where we go from bounce back and forth between theory and data and accumulate knowledge as we go through the processes of analysis and planning and analysis and planning. The planning leads us to gather data. The data leads to analysis of it, which uh, drives us to revise our theory back and forth. I mean, if one model is more useful to you, I mean, it's also a box that says all, all models are wrong, but some models are useful, right? If one model is more useful to you, you know, I, I think they're pretty similar. A corollary to all models are wrong, but some models are useful, I would tell you that the more useful a model becomes, the more treacherous it is. Think about it. Why would it be more treacherous? We imbue it with life. We forget it's a model, and we think it's reality. Anyway, that's off the subject. I couldn't resist. OK, so this organization decided that they, as they worked on improving calibration, they said that they wanted to do learning. And so they focused on the calibration process and said, what is it we can learn about the calibration process? And what they found is that it expanded the scope of what they were studying. I had the opportunity to be involved in a, um, I attended a, a management meeting where a young engineer made a presentation about their improvement efforts. And what he, was, he was talking very animatedly with this, with this uh, top management group of this plant of 800 or 900 people, and he was telling them about all the stuff they'd learned about this process. It was really neat. You know, he was really excited about this. And one of the managers brought him back down to earth with, the, with sort of a snide, a snide rendition of saying, were there any side effects to your study, like improved quality or improved throughput or stuff like that? Productivity was better. You know, he's, he was coming back to what was real, right? This guy was talking about learning. Come on, you know? Let's get back to what's real. So the manager pulled him back to what was real, but he wouldn't be pulled back. You know what he said? He said, sure, those things have improved. He didn't say anymore. He didn't say that the first time quality went, went from 90% to 99 plus percent. He didn't say that, in, that instead of calibrating an average of 12,000 units a day, they were calibrating an average of 17,000 units a day. He didn't throw those numbers at this manager, but what he talked about was the learning he'd that they'd gotten. He didn't want to put numbers on the limits and the benefits of that learning. So then what he said is, he said, and by the way, you know, besides improving quality, we know something more now. See, we started out, here's our initial charter, we started out focusing on calibration. Now we understand that calibration is at the end of a long line of processes. And what happens in final assembly and the subassembly processes and even in fabrication and purchasing of parts impacts the results. That's not rocket science, you might say. But it was new in this facility to think that way. Because that wasn't their bailiwick, they worked in calibration. So what they did is they started keeping track of stuff, and they would talk to their supplier departments when they thought something had changed. And they started waking their supplier departments up to all the problems they had before they knew they had them. Now, isn't that interesting? When customers are telling you about your problems before you know you've got problems, do you think that might spur somebody to action? Well, certainly in an environment of management by objective, and you know, you're being appraised versus these other people, right? I'm being a little snide. All right, anyway. 
what they did is they had, they had expanded their view. They expanded their view on one end to look at the customer and the way they use the parts, and they expanded their view on the other side to think of supplier departments. I mean, again, I mean, I'm not talking about sophisticated stuff here. We'll get to that in just a minute. No, not sophisticated stuff. We'll get to why I'm not talking about sophisticated stuff in just a minute. OK, results of thinking of improvement in terms of learning about processes. One of the things I caution you is, is it's, an, it's not as easy a way to get real quick progress. Visible progress isn't immediate. If the focus is on learning in the process of change instead of the outcomes, instead of what did you achieve, it's more on what do we learn from this process. So the question is, what did we learn, not did things get better as a result of this change? And there's no such thing as a mistake, as long as we have a discipline in place to learn from our, our ideas, our theories, as Dr. Deming would say. We propose theories, and then we test them, and then we learn from them. And as long as we're learning from those, nothing is thought of as a mistake or bad. Okay? Often, one rotation of the PDSA cycle leads to another, or several more. And learning, benef learning begets more learning. An improvement of the process being studied just follows the learning, and it can follow it for a long ways. That sounds pretty good, doesn't it? I mean, these are pretty good results these guys in calibration got, aren't they? Would you like to get results like that? Sure. So why do we need to go further? Well, so why profound knowledge? Dr. Deming, in his 1989 Osaka paper, which has been revised several times, and I don't know if uh, exactly this quote has been retained, but in 1989 he said, it is vital for management to manage the big losses. And the big losses, as Dr. Lloyd Nelson said years ago, are unknown and unknowable. I think you've you probably heard that term before, but most of them are not even under suspicion. We don't have a clue. Right? Where the big losses are. That's why I believe Dr. Deming's talking about profound knowledge. Dr. Deming has recently been showing a, a, a matrix, a little graph, that I don't think he showed this morning, talking about theory for leadership of the transformation. He attributes it to Ed Baker at Ford. And there's just three lines. It says, this leadership for the transformation, we ask in various parts of our organization, has it penetrated? I think that's an important question. Overall business strategy and planning, has that penetrated? Well, most organizations have to say, not yet. Personnel, legal, management, most organizations say, not yet. Unique processes on the factory floor, now we can start talking. You know, we got a lot of stuff going down there, we got all these teams working. Yes. Dr. Deming's quote was, here's where the big gains are, where the big potential gains are. He's even attached numbers. He thinks that if you do this, you might achieve 3% of the opportunities available to your organization. The other 97% are up here. So what have we been doing? If we've been focusing on the unique processes on the factory floor, we've been doing the Pareto principle in reverse. We've been working on the trivial many and not the vital few. Okay. So let me talk to you a little bit about a structure to think about change. There's lots of stuff going on now about change and, and changing systems and stuff. I'd like to share a model that was in, actually, Bill referred to this book this morning. It's a book simply titled Change. It's in my reference list. I didn't have the publisher or the date when I referred to it because I couldn't find my copy. Uh, it's by Watzlawick, Weakland, and Fish. It's a 1974 book published by W.W. Norton, if you want to try to get it. But what they do is they have this model for change. And they talk about persistence and change in this book. And people scratch their heads and say, you mean persistence or change? And they say, no, persistence and change. And they talk about two orders of change. The first one is, surprisingly, first order change. And what they talk about that is, and I paraphrase them, and I hope I haven't, but the liberties I've taken, I hope I haven't misrepresented them. So now you have to get the book and find out, right? Change within a system. This kind of change, no matter how persistently applied, will not fundamentally change the system. We are often in systems where we do more of the same, right? I don't know if any of you have ever been in an organization where the engineering folks and the manufacturing folks had a problem 
because the engineering folks specified some, made some specifications, manufacturing folks built some stuff, and there were some problems with it. Engineering folks said, well, we'll crank those specifications down tighter. That'll do it. And there'll more and more and more of the same kind of specifications. Dr. Deming mentioned America 2000 today. Some would argue that that's simply more of the same. There's not fundamental ideas of change, of system there. It's change within a system. So the first order change is change that resides entirely within a system. Second order change is surprisingly, right, change of the system. Some actions now taken to affect second order change seem irrational to those inside the system. That's kind of scary, isn't it? Now, maybe part of the reason I like this theory is because that one of them is, uh, they use analogies, and one of them is the analogy to mathematical group theory. And all of you who had you know, mathematical group theory will appreciate that, probably. And the other 99% of you won't. But anyway. And this is, uh, I think, the analogy was made to the theory of logical type, that we can't understand something unless we are at a different level. We can't, basically saying we can't understand the system from within it. An example that we, Watts, Lewick, Weakland, and Fish use, and I think effectively, we'll see what you think, is the example of two sailors frantically trying to steady a steady boat. Type order one change, first order change, is where one person leans out one side of the boat. The other perceives that that's going to create instability. So what are they going to do? Try to be one of those sail sailors. You don't want the boat to tip over, so you'll lean out the other side of the boat. Well, the first one perceives that and then leans further, and you can imagine what's happening. Something that might act like rule three of the funnel experiment, but it doesn't matter whether it is or not. They lean further and further outside of the boat. And what is the result? The exact opposite of what they intended, right? Both of them, at some point, want to make this boat more stable. But reacting to the immediate stimulus, they're making it less so by leaning further and further out and escalating the situation further and further. What is the fundamental stabilizing move here? If you're one of these people, do you know how to make this boat more stable? If you're sitting in another boat watching them, them do this, could you tell them what to do? Hey, move back to the middle, right? So if they want to make an a fundamentally stable state here, one of them has got to take the seemingly irrational move of moving back towards the middle. Even though the boat seems unsteady now and maybe tilting to the other direction, you need to start moving in. See, then the other person is a clear choice. They move back in or they get wet. Okay? Now, and I don't want to dismiss the possibility of everybody getting wet, all right, because sometimes that stuff happens. But the end result, one way or the other, will be fundamentally more stable. Right? Thank you. You must remember I'm a statistician. I'm doing my best. OK. But anyway, this is the idea of applying more and more of the same. There are stories like this all over the place, where people perceive something that's going on in their system, and instead of seeing a fundamental change in their system, all they see is a perturbation that they just need to compensate for. An example that's from the Handy Book. He talks about the natives of Central America when they saw the Spanish, the sails of the Spanish ships coming over the horizon. They turned to each other and said, "What an interesting anomaly of nature!" And went about their business. They'd never seen sails before. The only thing they could assume was that nature had created some kind of mirage out there or some kind of vision. They weren't exactly ready for what happened next. Another, another reference to this, another story about this. Peter Senge, in his book, The Fifth Discipline, talks a lot about systems theory. And he talks about the idea of mental models, which is really the idea of examining the assumptions under which our system operates. One of the stories he tells is of Royal Dutch Shell. And I don't know, probably. Some of you, anyway, have read that book. But about Royal Dutch Shell, he talks about what they did in their group planning department. 
They thought their job was to foresee the future and share that future with the managers who would then make management decisions which would adapt to that future. Well, they did that. They did their best. And they saw really turbulent times ahead. This was in the early 70s for the oil business, the very early 70s. They saw very turbulent times ahead for the oil business. And they shared all their assumptions about the future of the oil business with the executives. And they got looked at and said, you're crazy. We've been in this business for you know, 25, 30, 35, 40 years. We know this business. This business has never been like that. Why would it look like that five years from now? So then what the planning people did is they backed up a step. And they started working with these guys to help them understand, to help understand what are the assumptions you have about the way the world will go. And when those assumptions got written down in black and white and the executives examined them, as Singhi said, that world seemed about as likely as a fairy tale. They started listening to different possible worlds, not just one. They examined how they could react to different fundamental changes in the oil business. One of the sets of assumptions they looked at was something that was very akin to OPEC, two years before OPEC formed. Maybe it was less. Before OPEC formed, that's the key. Okay? When OPEC formed, the people at Royal Dutch Shell knew exactly how to respond to that kind of fundamental change in their business. The rest of the oil companies looked at it as though, oh, there's sales on the horizon. What an interesting fluke of nature. So Royal Dutch Shell has been very successful doing that. It, maybe, it's, maybe it's like the whole business of paradigms. Many of you, I'm sure, have seen Joel Barker's videotape, The Business of Paradigms, where he talks about the idea of paradigms. And really, I like to think about that as being very similar to the mental model idea. What world do we live in? Dr. Deming uses that analogy a lot, that metaphor a lot, in explaining his philosophy. He says, this morning, he said, world one is a world where monopolies want long-term optimization of their system for everybody. They want to be in business long-term. They want to make profit long-term. That's world one. World two is where what they're doing is going for the greatest return in the short term. And their reactions in those two worlds will be very different. Maybe what we can do is help people understand that they're, what kind of world they're in. So that's, a, that's a, that idea. Now, what is, I guess to complete the, the parallel here, improvement versus approach. See, I believe, and, it, and that's really all it is. I mean, it's not, it's empirical. I have, it makes sense to me. I don't know how to appeal to you on the emotional or physical levels, but um, logic has always been my best anyway. Um, there's a barrier here, I think, that until we start going beyond just learning about processes, we are not going to get the kind of, as Dr. Deming now says, 97% improvements, benefits that we can get in our organizations. I don't show a leveling off here because I think, you know, if this is 3%, you know, 100% is maybe about where Dr. Deming is, you know? So it's not going to level off at this point. And I believe profound knowledge is the way that we can get there. Now, how can we understand profound knowledge? You've seen this before today. I'll just remind you very briefly. Profound knowledge, a system of profound knowledge, consists of four, four elements. And they're interrelationships. We're talking about a system here, folks. Appreciation for a system, theory of variation, theory of knowledge, and some knowledge of psychology. And this isn't exactly the wording Dr. Deming used this morning. 14 points fall out as, a natural consequence, as natural consequences of applying profound knowledge to a business. Somebody asked me earlier about, about some teaching that I did several years ago about the 14 points, and I'm wondering if I'd written something up. And, and, and all I can think of is I don't, I don't very often teach people about the 14 points anymore. I teach, them profound, I teach them some of the stuff in profound knowledge. I talk to them about a system. And I let them derive the 14 points. Try it. It works. People are much less, they have lots fewer objections to eliminate MBOs and eliminate performance appraisals when they come up with them as barriers to their organization working as a system. In other words, oh, I buried the system diagram, but it's back here somewhere. If we take Dr. Deming's system diagram, 
All I do is I say, let's assume this is a vision for our organization, that we've got a single aim, and we all want to work together towards that vision. The first element of profound knowledge, really the idea of a system. And I don't tell them anymore. I say, now think about what's in your, what in your business is, is causing this to happen, you know, the segmentation of your business into it, all of its parts, you know, so that you, you, nobody can talk to anybody else. And the destruction of system, as Nitta has, and I don't remember what page it is in Dr. Deming's handout. Nitta Bakaitis talked about that. I say, OK, now think about what drives those barriers in your organization. Two questions. The first one is, what drives the barriers? The second one is, what can we do to eliminate those barriers? Now, that doesn't tell them how to do it, OK? But conceptually, any group I've ever worked with has said, well, the way we manage by numbers creates barriers between departments. The way we reward people, the way we recognize people, the way we evaluate people, the way we judge people, that creates barriers. And it's amazing how much more receptive people are when they come up with those ideas on their own. OK, but that, again, that's, maybe it's preaching. That was a, a little bit of a side, of an aside. A really useful way to think about the system of profound knowledge and its role in all this, I think, has been shared by a woman named Nita Bakaitis. Dr. Deming referred to her earlier. She gave a talk in Minneapolis in June of this year. The talk is referred to at the back of your paper. Um, it was sponsored by the, in a conference by the North Central Deming Management Forum. Uh, maybe Minneapolis's, well, Minneapolis's Deming user group. And she gave a talk, and in the proceedings from that talk is a paper. And one of the key elements of this paper, this talk, is that she sees the system of profound knowledge as a lens, see, a lens, through which we can examine our organization. So if we hold up that lens that's profound knowledge, and we say, hmm, what's going on in our organization? And we look at our organization through that lens, Maybe it'll give us a different insight about, or different sets of insights about our organizations than we have had up till now. OK? I think that's the role of profound knowledge, to allow us to look at our world, at our business, through the eyes of a different world. I think that's the role of profound knowledge. I don't know, maybe you feel compelled. I mean, there are only 615 of you. But don't let that scare you. It sure scared me, but it shouldn't scare you. No, no comments, no com So there are two pieces to this. We look through this lens of profound knowledge and understand there's a different way to look at organizations. I think that's one of the things. The other thing I think we can do is then we can go back and do some of the Senge stuff about mental models. Once we have this other lens, so we sort of have two lenses that we can look at our organization through, the one that we've been conditioned to look at, and then this lens of profound knowledge, which is a new one. We know what the lens of profound knowledge looks like, right? Dr. Deming has outlined it for us. It's these four elements and their interactions. We can hold it up and look at the lens itself, if you will, as well as looking through it. I think what, Dr. what uh, Peter Senge is asking you to do in his book is also take the lens through which your company looks at itself and hold that up and say, what does this lens look like? We can look at the profound knowledge lens and see the shape of the lens itself. Let's do that with the way we think about our company. Does that make any sense? So I think that's a role of profound, or a primary role of profound knowledge. Almost every seminar, when, doc, when people listen to Dr. Deming, they come away and they say to me, when I'm, you know, when I'm one of the people who facilitates the working groups, they come and say to me, but you know, all Dr. Deming's talking about is common sense. I learned something really important today, I think, listening to Dr. Deming. I mean, not that I haven't listened to him before, but some of these things you have to hear a lot of times. In his chapter three on page five, he says, beware of common sense. He didn't specifically talk about this page today. He says, common sense tells us to rank children in school, rank people on the job, rank teams, divisions, dealers, costs, and hospitals, reward the best, punish the worst, reward it with a day off without pay, the ticket seller with the highest discrepancy for the month, and on and on. Common sense tells us to have quotas for people. Common sense tells us to speak to the operator about it when a customer reports something wrong. Common sense tells us that if an item or service fails to meet requirements, take action now. 
The wrong action will only produce more mistakes. Common sense tells us to reward the salesman of the month, the one that sold the most. Common sense tells us all these things. So now when people come up to me and say, but what Dr. Deming says is only common sense. My question to them is, how will you know which common sense you should listen to? Because this right stuff is common sense, but all this wrong stuff is common sense too. That's what the lens of profound knowledge will help you do. It'll help you discern what will be useful for your organization and what won't be. What will help you move towards optimization and what won't. All right, now I'm going to get a little hokey on you for a minute. Some of you might be thinking I've already been doing that. I don't know if any of you looked in the western sky two months ago and saw something that looked like that. Anybody have that experience? Anybody? There are a few hands, quite a few hands. We shared an experience then. There was a convergence of three planets in the western sky two months ago. It was almost two months ago right now. It was the early teens of June. And I think the planets were, I think this one was Venus, right? And this one was Saturn or Jupiter? Jupiter, thanks. And this one was Mars. And see, it even looks red. <laughs> and it did. You know, if you looked at it in the dark night sky, it looked red then, too. You could see the redness of it. What a beautiful sight. So why am I sharing that with you now? See, to me, that's become a watchword. I wasn't very impressed with it. You know, I saw it in the paper until I saw it. I saw about it in the paper, and they said, oh, convergence of three planets. I didn't even read the article. But I saw it. And I thought, that's pretty impressive. Three planets in close convergence and also close to the moon. It's kind of a neat sight. And then I started going back and reading the article. And when's it going to happen again? Three planets from our solar system. We'll see them in convergence 220 years from now. I was telling somebody that this morning. He said, well, I better get my calendar out. <laughs> now, I'm not sure I know any calendars that have 220-year planners. I mean, there's a six-year planner in some of these, but I don't know about 220-year planners. But anyway, to me, I thought it was really a neat idea because it was a convergence, if you will, of heavenly bodies. The only problem with the analogy, from my perspective, is they converged, and then what happened? Now I see, I look at the moon, and I'm sad because it doesn't have any company. Okay? The convergence is over. The planets have gone their ways. Well, now this is the personal part. See, to me, the stuff I've been learning from Dr. Deming, the stuff I've been re learning reading novels like Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, you'll hear another novel refer reference in just a minute, the things I've been learning all over my life, guess what? I'm beginning to learn that my life is a system. I have a work life, I've got a personal life, I might have a spiritual life, but they're all connected. I have an entertainment life, well, sort of. Okay? But they're all connected. Life is a system. And the stuff I'm learning from all these parts of my life, they're all sort of converging to help me understand that whole system. All right, now I'll get off of it, because it's kind of hokey, I guess. All right, and there are only a couple comments I want to share with you about some of the things I personally have learned about profound knowledge, which have been very helpful to me to understand some of the parts of profound knowledge I, uh, until then, hadn't understood as well. One of the things, see, I always feel, I feel like, maybe I'm like Henry. I mean, I have a PhD in statistics, so I figured variation was no sweat. Well, that was a story. But now I feel like I've got a pretty good grasp on variation, right? And understanding of the system, I have a lot to learn, but, you know, I'm not, I'm not, you know, I don't feel like a baby there. But when you get to the theory of knowledge and, and understanding of psychology, look, you know, I was a mathematician as an undergraduate, a statistician as a graduate student. When did I have time for things like philosophy and psychology? Oh, sure, I took Psych 21. Yeah, it wasn't 101 in my, in my school. It was Psych 21. But I didn't really learn the kind of stuff I think Dr. Deming's teaching me. Anyway, so those are some of the areas I've been thinking about and learning a lot about. One of them is, what is the role of theory in all this stuff? Oh, and before, before I share this with you, let me set it up. Recently, I read... James Michener's novel, Chesapeake. Okay, Some of you have probably read that. I think it was a wonderful book. Um, 1,100 pages of a wonderful book, but you, know, you can have too much of a good thing, maybe, but maybe not. But it was a wonderful book. Near the end, one of the fictional characters, and I don't know if probably a lot of you are familiar with the way Michener writes, Chesapeake is discussing the evolution and, and the succession of 
generations on the eastern shore of the Chesapeake Bay from about 1500 to 1978 is the last entry. Well, near the end of the book, there's an entry dated 1976. And what it is, is one of these fictional characters was involved in Watergate. Oops. He got caught, got sent to prison, and then later came out of prison. And what this is, is it's a small snippet of a discussion between this character, whose name is uh, Paxmore, actually Pusey Paxmore, and his old friend Owen Steed. And they're talking about causes of, of Watergate. And I hope the relevance will be clear to you after all this. right? Um, so I'll, I'll show it to you, but then I'll also read it to you. Steed says, how do you explain the corruption and the near treason? Okay, and I figure if Henry can do politics, so can I, right? But I'm not, I'm not trying to highlight any of the politics or any of the judgments made by the characters here. Just the essential message, okay? The response was from Paxmore is, uh, men without character, and that's a judgmental part, slip from one position to the next and never comprehend the awful downward course they're on. I don't know if any of that sounds at all familiar to what's happened in any of your companies, but Steed says, couldn't Nixon have stopped it? And the response by Paxmore was, why do I keep getting these things crooked? The response by Paxmore said, Woody, Woodrow Wilson could have, or Teddy Roosevelt, and this, this character is a Quaker and, and was speaking at this point in the traditional Quaker style, and does thee know why? Do you know why? Over long experience, long apprenticeship, they had accumulated a theory of government, a theory of democracy, if you will. And they would have detected the rot the minute it started. A lot of us think of, you know, people talk to me about, oh, don't bother us with the why of the tools. I think that's very important. If we understand the theory behind the tools, we can understand the uses of the tools and the limits of uses of the tools. If we understand the theory behind the 14 points, we can understand how they apply to our company and the limits of the application to our company, if there are any, or the application to our personal life, if we think of our whole lives as a system. It seems to me theory is very useful. I mean, it's got a very useful purpose here. So that's, I'll stop pleading with you. Um, then other, other example of the role of theory is a little bit more lighthearted. Uh, I know some people who, were, when they were talking about the uh, convergence of planets, one of the guys sort of pulled the leg of another one. I mean, this is sort of a weird joke, I guess. But what he do, did is he drew this picture up there of how the, how the planets and moon were going to look like, what they were going to look like in convergence. And this other guy thought, oh, what a neat picture. And here's the picture. Whoops. Anybody know what's wrong with that picture? Can anybody tell me what's wrong with this picture? What's wrong with it? Well, there's one little problem. What causes the moon to be a crescent? It's like kind of the shadow of the Earth or something, right? And if the Earth blocks out the light from the moon, hmm. OK, but without theory, this looks great. All right, so that's a little silly. Thing. I guess that's a statistician's humor for you. OK. Now, I want to share with you some new learning I've had about, about psychology. And at least, I think, systems and theory of knowledge. Uh, some of this I learned from, well, I actually learned a lot of this from a philosopher I know. And uh, I was listening to a tape of a lecture he gave last night, and that's some of the learning I got from this. So um, again, this is why it's handwritten. He went into the etymology of psychology. To the Greeks, the idea of human psychology was, was the study of what it means to be a human being. Human psychology is all about what it means to be a human being. Now, I edited the part where it said, as opposed to salivating dogs or running rats, OK? This philosopher's perception is, if we go back to the core of what the Greek philosopher, the Greeks were talking about when they, you know, the, the idea of human psychology is, what is it in essence to be a human being? And a statement that could be made is, if we say we understand what it means to be human beings, how can we do that and treat workers as though they are less important than the machines they work with? 
This is an idea from a woman named Simone Weil, who was a French philosopher of the early 20th century. Um, she was born in like 1908 or 1909 and died in 1943. And the last thing on this page is from an essay called Factory Work, she talks about things play the role of men, men play the role of things. Part of the reason of sharing this is maybe this helps us understand a little bit why somebody would be interested in understanding psychology for an organization that wanted to transform. It's not how to manipulate people and get them to behave the ways we want, I don't think. And somebody, you know, there are lots of you more learned about this than I, and you could challenge me on that. But that's not my, es my sense, is that it's not about how to manipulate people's behavior. It's rather about how can we help people. Why psychology? To go on further with this, this learning, this new learning I have, is maybe it's necessary to articulate the vision of an organization. I think it probably is necessary to articulate the aim of an organization, or the vision of an organization. But I think maybe what you can understand by studying people like Simone Weil, and this is crazy, right? Maybe first we need to articulate the vision of what it is to be a human being. Now that's pretty esoteric. Now, a lot of you work for companies that would support that kind of learning. If you do, that's great. I think the IRS would probably complain. You know, if you took a course like this and wanted to claim it as a, ta as a deductible expense because it was work-related, any of you wonder if you get in an argument with the IRS? I think you probably have to make a case. Okay, but the idea is, let's, work, let's look at the human being, and then, by the way, they happen to work. So let's think about it that way. All right, so what Simone Weil says, then the next thing I think is really shocking, and taking this to another step, Simone Weil says, the engineers who design machinery, above all others, need to have a liberal education. Now, liberal education means education in, in rhetoric and, and the, well, the art of, of speaking and writing. It means education in, in logic and other branches of philosophy, right? Sure, that's standard fare for our engineers, right? Because, and, and her reason to me is very compelling. They're the ones, they must understand what it is to be a human being so that they can design machines appropriately. Now this applies, I think, to service as well. If we're talking about service processes, you could say it applies there too. Go back and look in your organization and look at the processes as they've been designed and think about whether they were designed for other human beings. In lots of manufacturing facilities, at least, I think, I can speak with some authority there, in manufacturing facilities, if you go and look at the work processes and the machines, they are designed primarily for machines, not for human beings. Okay? We're trying to integrate things like ergonomics and the way people... I think that we're talking about more fundamental issues than that. All right? And I don't know if that's... To me, this is, this is real learning that I've been doing lately, and maybe, I don't know, maybe you don't think this is important. Uh, all I can tell you is I think it's neat, and I've been getting a lot out of it. A common statement in missions and so forth is, is that human beings are our greatest resource. I mean, that's a pretty, you know, that, that's a pretty forward statement these days. I mean, that's pretty progressive, right? Human beings are our most important resource. Well, let's look at it a different way. What does this do? This puts human beings in the same category as steel and other raw materials. Well, maybe it's appropriate that we have that in our current mission statements. Oh, sorry about that. How different might it be if we said in our organizations, our company is going to be the greatest resource in the lives of human beings, our employees, our suppliers, our customers? How different would that be? Okay, And that's pretty clearly from my friend. This is Dr. John Edelman. He's professor of philosophy at a college in Rochester, New York. And this is from a lecture he gave at the end of May. Okay, I just want to make sure I cite my sources. So. Going back to our improvement of calibration, if they, th these people study profound knowledge, oops, I gave away where they are in the process. 
If they get to the point of understanding profound knowledge, they'll understand that they've got to do more than just look at all the stuff oriented to the production of these units that they calibrate. They got to think about the design products, the customer research process, the, the way they manage the plants, the way they do performance appraisals, the policies with which they deal with suppliers, and a host of other things that I couldn't think of at the moment. Besides, I didn't want my picture to get too ugly, I mean too messy. But we can't understand those things until we have some of the kinds of things that Dr. Deming talks about in profound knowledge. So going back, my intent in this presentation was to talk to you about the role profound knowledge in particular but learning in general can have an improvement of, pro of our organizations. Learning about processes gets us some leverage. I need to grab my first picture again. Um, learning about processes gathers us some leverage. First of all, we can use up the current process knowledge. That'll get us someplace. But then we need to learn more. Learning about processes will get us some more leverage. But the way we really get leverage is learning not about processes, but about all the stuff which will allow us to step outside the systems we're trapped in. Okay. I think some of this is why Dr. Deming often says profound knowledge must come from outside. I'm not sure exactly what that means, but it means, I mean, it, I'm not sure it means a person from outside, but I think it needs at least very, very clearly stimulus from outside our systems to allow us to think, to examine the lens with which we look at our organizations, and maybe produce and look through a different lens. Thanks for your attention. That's all I have for you today. <laughs>